Good day and welcome to the Neighbors Industry First Quarter 2024 Earnings Conference Call. All participants will be in a listen-only mode. Should you need assistance, please signal a conference specialist by pressing the start key followed by zero. After today's presentation, there will be an opportunity to ask questions. To ask a question, you may press star, then one, on the touchtone phone. To withdraw your question, please press star, then two. Please note, this event is being recorded. I would now like to introduce William Conroy, Vice President, Corporate Development and Investor Relations. Please go ahead. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining Neighbors First Quarter 2024 Earnings Conference Call. Today, we will follow our customary format with Tony Petrello, our Chairman, President, and Chief Executive Officer, and William Restrepo, our Chief Financial Officer, providing their perspectives on the quarter's results, along with insights into our markets and how we expect neighbors to perform in these markets. In support of these remarks, a slide deck is available, both as a download within the webcast and in the Investor Relations section of Neighbors.com. Instructions for the replay of this call are posted on the website as well. With us today, in addition to Tony, William, and me, are other members of the senior management team. Since much of our commentary today will include our forward expectations, they may constitute forward-looking statements within the meaning of the Securities Act of 1933 and the Securities Exchange Act of 1934. Such forward-looking statements are subject to certain risks and uncertainties, as disclosed by neighbors from time to time in our filings with the Securities and Exchange Commission. As a result of these factors, our actual results may vary materially from those indicated or implied by such forward-looking statements. Also, during the call, we may discuss certain non-GAAP financial measures, such as net debt, adjusted operating income, adjusted EBITDA, and adjusted free cash flow. All references to EBITDA made by either Tony or William during their presentations, whether qualified by the word adjusted or otherwise, mean adjusted EBITDA, as that term is defined on our website and in our earnings release. Likewise, unless the context clearly indicates otherwise, references to cash flow mean adjusted free cash flow, as that non-GAAP measure is defined in our earnings release. We have posted to the Investor Relations section of our website a reconciliation of these non-GAAP financial measures to the most recently comparable GAAP measures. With that, I will turn the call over to Tony to begin. Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us today as we present our results and outlook. Total adjusted EBITDA exceeded our expectations in the first quarter. Daily margins in the U.S. lower 48 remained strong, and our two technology segments performed well. I would like to start my detailed remarks with comments on our international markets. The strength of the international expansion continues to surprise us. It's been over a decade since I've seen an environment as robust as this one. We have a unique opportunity to strengthen our international footprint. On our previous conference call, I mentioned we had scheduled the deployment of seven international rigs in 2024, three in Saudi Arabia and four in Algeria. In the first quarter, we started two of the rigs in Algeria, and so far in the second quarter, we started the third Algeria unit. That's the update on our previously expected deployments. In addition, we have also been successful with re recent negotiations for three rigs in Argentina. We expect two of those to go to work in 2024. That leaves a total of six more rigs slated to start up over the remainder of 2024. The third Argentina rig should commence operations in early 2025. I would like to point out that all three of these awards in Argentina have long-term contracts with favorable pricing and high rates of return. Additionally, we have been shortlisted for three rigs to go to work in the Middle East. These rigs would also have multi-year term contracts with favorable economics. In the lower 48, industry activity has been disappointing. We had hoped for a moderate increase during the first quarter. From beginning to end, the lower 48 industry land rate count declined by four rigs. The average lower 48 industry count was essentially flat. Nonetheless, leading edge pricing for the high performance, technology focused rigs in the lower 48 was stable. This helped support our own daily rig margin. 
Once again, our expense control in the lower 48 was outstanding. Daily operating expenses declined. In the first quarter, total adjusted EBITDA for neighbors was $221 million. Our global average rig count grew by four rigs. This increase was spread across our operations. Our drilling solutions and rig technology segments together generated EBITDA of $39 million. Combined, they accounted for more than 17% of total EBITDA in the quarter. Next, let me make some comments on five key drivers of our results. I'll start with our performance in the U.S. Daily rig margins in our lower 48 rig fleet exceeded our expectations. The market for our rigs remains strong. At slightly above $16,000, daily margin in the first quarter was higher than we expected. Revenue was better than our projections. Expenses declined. I am pleased with this performance. These results demonstrate our team's ability to execute at an impressive level in this market environment. We are working diligently to maintain, if not improve, this execution. The industry rig count was essentially flat in the first quarter. Our own rig count increased, but it was below our target. As we have said before, pricing discipline remains our priority. Our reported lower 48 daily rig margin reflects the financial results of just our drilling rigs. The drilling solutions portfolio, NDS, generates significant margin on top of that. I'll discuss this in more detail in a few moments. Now I'll review our international drilling business. As I said earlier, this international market is the strongest we have seen in a decade. It is providing us with multiple high return opportunities to reactivate rigs. We see tangible evidence in tendering and negotiating activity, rig awards, and deployments. During the first quarter, we deployed two rigs of our four-rig award in Algeria. A third rig has since started. We have also been awarded three incremental rigs in Argentina. These awards, across multiple operators, should commence operations around the end of the year, two in the fourth quarter and one in the first quarter of 2025. All three of the rigs are currently idle in the U.S. We plan to transfer them to Argentina. This redeployment is an excellent use of our existing assets. In Saudi Arabia, the sixth new build is currently finishing its acceptance procedure. It should begin drilling imminently. Two more will be deployed this year. Another five are scheduled for 2025. And the final two of the existing awards should start in 2026. Finally, we were shortlisted for three rigs in a large market in the Middle East. The rigs that we bid are already in country. This opportunity would cement our position in this important geography. With these developments, it is clear our prior optimism was well-placed. I am confident we will report even more progress on this front. For the first quarter, daily margin in our international segment was impacted by labor unrest in Colombia involving four rigs. Looking forward, we expect deployments and operational improvements to generate daily margin of approximately $17,000 by the end of the year. Let me finish my remarks on our international business with a few comments on our activity in Saudi Arabia. Several offshore drilling contractors in the kingdom have announced the temporary suspension of operations on a number of rigs. As for Standard's outlook, we are bullish. Aramco's development of the natural gas resource is expanding. Its focus on the unconventional land reserves is increasing. Standard's fleet overwhelmingly targets gas. Moreover, the recent new build awards are for rigs capable of drilling for gas. The international expansion for neighbors still has legs. Beyond our announcements today, we see prospects for additional rigs in international markets. These include units in Kuwait, more opportunities in Algeria, rigs in Argentina, Mexico, and elsewhere in the Eastern Hemisphere. Next, let me discuss our technology and innovation. NDS's revenue grew sequentially on neighbors' own lower 48 rigs and on international rigs. This growth was offset by a decline in the lower 48 third-party market. Overall, NDS EBITDA exceeded our expectations. From a product line perspective, managed pressure drilling and rig cloud drove the segment's first quarter performance. Next, I will detail the value that NDS generates in the lower 48 market. The average daily margin in the lower 48 from our drilling and drilling solutions businesses combined 
was $19,440 in the first quarter. Of that, NDS contributed more than $3,400 per day. This incremental margin is significant. We generate this margin with limited capital spending, so the returns are impressive. In the first quarter, penetration of NDS and services on neighbors' rigs in the lower 48 remained high. On third-party rigs, we saw growth in smart slide directional steering, our Revit stick slip mitigation, and our smart slide smart nav directional guidance software. NDS's first quarter results demonstrate the value of its broad portfolio and its focus on both neighbors owned and third party rigs. Looking ahead, we are making significant inroads with smaller contractors interested in adding neighbor solutions to their portfolios. At the same time, international clients are increasingly recognizing the performance improvements in the U.S. They, too, are accelerating their adoption of neighbors advanced technology. Next, let me make some comments on our capital structure. Early in the first quarter, we redeemed the notes that were due in 2024 and 2025. We accomplished this with the proceeds from the $650 million of notes issued at the end of 2023. Our next maturity is in 2026. As we look ahead, our first priority for free cash flow remains reducing net debt and improving our credit ratings. I'll finish this part of the discussion with remarks on sustainability and the energy transition. Our energy transition initiatives, as you know, focus on improving operational efficiency and reducing emissions intensity. These technology solutions made a significant contribution to our rig technologies segment results. The most impactful remains our PowerTap module. This unit connects rigs to the grid, greatly reducing diesel fuel consumption as well as related emissions. With the appropriate availability of grid power, operators can realize cost savings by employing PowerTap. In a significant development, the first PowerTap unit deployed outside the U.S. is running in Argentina. This unit incorporates a frequency converter for international applications. We have additional units under construction, including two destined for international clients. Interest in our energy transition portfolio remains strong in the U.S. On top of that, we see growing opportunities overseas. Next, I will discuss the rig pricing environment. First quarter results for our lower 48 operation reflect continued stability in leading edge market prices. Our approach to the lower 48 market is to exercise pricing discipline and support activity levels while delivering superior value to our customers. NDS is an integral element in this approach. In the international market, we have growing visibility to additional near-term rig deployments. Pricing on these pending deployments is attractive, reflecting the strong conditions we see across the international domain. We surveyed the largest lower 48 clients at the end of the first quarter. Our survey covers 17 operators, which accounts for approximately 45% of the lower 48 working rig count at the end of the quarter. The latest survey indicates this group's year-end 2024 rig count will be modestly lower than the total at the end of the first quarter. Essentially, all the projected decline relates to announced merger activity. From our past experience, combined activity usually drops immediately after the merger is completed. Over time, though, we have generally seen a return to prior activity levels for the combined companies. We anticipate the same behavior by our customers following this latest burst of mergers. Aside from the mergers, we believe that clients remain cautious about their plans for 2024, particularly in gas-focused basins. Our view of the international market is bullish. With the international additions now in hand, we would increase our international rig count for all of 2024 by nine rigs. That's up by two versus the seven we had previously announced. So seven is now nine for 2024. And for 2025, we have six expected deployments including five in Saudi Arabia and one in Argentina. The prospective Middle East rigs would add three on top of that 2025 total. Next, I will share other notable recent highlights and accomplishments in addition to the rig awards in Argentina. CanRig received an order from an existing client in the Middle East for six land drilling packages. This order demonstrates CanRig's outstanding reputation in the international land market. It also evidences the wide breadth of the international expansion. 
And in the lower 48, a drilling contractor has begun standardizing its entire fleet to neighbor's rig cloud platform. This development is a significant endorsement of rig cloud, and it clearly demonstrates the value of neighbor's third-party strategy. Let me finish my remarks with the following. Our performance in the first quarter exceeded our expectations. We are making meaningful progress capturing the significant opportunities in our international markets and for our advanced technology. Now, let me turn the call over to William, who will discuss our financial results. Thank you, Tony, and good afternoon, everyone. During the first quarter, our global markets continued to diverge, with a strong expansion driving international markets, while the U.S. maintained its flat to downward trend. Our international rig count improved as we deployed rigs in Saudi Arabia and Algeria. At the same time, we were awarded three rigs in Argentina, and in another tender in the MENA region, pending finalization of the technical review, we were successful commercially in an additional three rigs. The U.S. market somewhat disappointed, with fewer rigs added than we targeted. But pricing was higher than we anticipated. And despite the weakening industry rig count in the lower 48 market, drilling solutions and rig technologies beat our forecast. Revenue from operations for the first quarter was $734 million compared to $726 million in the prior quarter, a 1.1% improvement. U.S. drilling revenue increased by 2.3% to $272 million, primarily driven by additional activity in Alaska. Lower 48 drilling and offshore drilling also contributed to the increase. Our average rig count in the lower 48 was 71.9, an increase of 1.6 rigs sequentially. Average daily revenue held at approximately $35,500. Revenue from our international drilling segment was $349 million, a 1.9% improvement over fourth quarter results. This increase was driven by a new build startup in the fourth quarter and operational improvements in Saudi Arabia as well as deployments of the first two of four rigs awarded in Algeria. Revenue from neighbors drilling solutions declined sequentially by $1.5 million due to lower activity in the U.S. lower 48 market. Despite flat average industry rig count in the U.S., we grew NDS sales on neighbors rigs by 3.6%. We also expanded our presence in international markets by almost 2%. Rig technologies revenue decreased by $9.1 million, or 15.4%, following strong seasonal year-end deliveries. Turning to EBITDA and the outlook, adjusted EBITDA for the quarter was $221 million, compared to $230 million in the fourth quarter. EBITDA in U.S. drilling increased to $120 million from $118 million, a 2% gain compared to the prior quarter, driven by higher activity in Alaska and higher lower 48 rig count. However, a slight reduction in daily margins somewhat offset these gains. Lower 48 drilling EBITDA decreased slightly. The lower 48 results demonstrated the ongoing trends of the fourth quarter. Average rig count of 71.9 reflected an increase of nearly two rigs from the prior quarter in a market that is continuing to exhibit high levels of activity churn. Ultimately, the pending EMP mergers should result in a healthier and more sustainable lower 48 environment. However, in the short term, these consolidations have put pressure on the total rate count as operators absorb their acquisitions. In addition, gas-focused drilling has continued to weaken. We anticipate our rate count in this market to average approximately 70 for the second quarter. The leading edge price environment continues to be stable and our average daily revenue held up well. Our efforts to limit costs remain effective. Average daily rig margin at $16,011 was a moderate $229 below the prior quarter. For the second quarter, we project our average daily rig gross margin at approximately $15,500. With leading edge revenue per day in the low to mid $30,000 range, the expected sequential reduction reflects repricing of renewals. On a net basis, Alaska and the U.S. offshore businesses 
performed better than we anticipated. In the first quarter, the combined EBITDA of these two operations was $21.4 million, an increase of $2.7 million. This improvement was primarily driven by activity in Alaska. Combined EBITDA for Alaska and U.S. offshore in the second quarter should be similar to first quarter levels. International EBITDA decreased by $3 million, or 2.9%, to $102.5 million. Average recount increased to 81 in the first quarter from 79.6, reflecting the startup of a new build in Saudi Arabia and the commencement of two rigs going back to work in Algeria late in the quarter. The gain in rig count was upset by a $600 deterioration in daily margin, reflecting a union strike in Colombia. During the quarter, we saw the commencement of recertification work for several rigs recently renewed in Saudi Arabia. This process normally results in some lost revenue. For the second quarter, we project international average rig count to increase between two to three rigs driven by the full quarter impact of the recent additions in Saudi Arabia and Algeria, as well as startups for incremental rigs in those countries. For average daily gross margin, we are targeting approximately $15,700. The anticipated modest decrease as compared to the first quarter primarily reflects an increase in lost revenue from continued recertification activity in Saudi Arabia. Drilling Solutions adjusted EBITDA declined by 7.9% to $31.8 million in the first quarter. The fourth quarter of last year was particularly strong, with several projects that came to an end late in the year. Gross margin for NDS was almost 52%. While we saw some softness in the lower 48, we continued to see increased penetration in international markets. Internationally, NDS EBITDA grew by over 7% sequentially. We expect second quarter EBITDA for drilling solutions to come in essentially in line with the first quarter. Rick Technologies generated EBITDA of $6.8 million, a $2 million decline versus the fourth quarter, mainly related to lower capital equipment and parts sales. Normally, these items are seasonally strong at the end of the year. We expect Rick Technologies EBITDA in the second quarter to increase by approximately $2 million. Now turning to liquidity and cash generation, in the first quarter, free cash flow as we anticipated was slightly above break-even. As I have mentioned previously, the first quarter for neighbors has the heaviest cash outflows. In the first quarter, we incurred several annual payments, including property and other taxes, as well as employee incentive bonuses. Together, these payments, which did not recur during the remainder of the year, amounted to approximately $23 million. In addition, interest expenses on our senior notes are higher in the first and third quarters of the year. Capital expenses of $112 million, including $35 million for the Sanat New Build Program, were a bit lower than forecast. But collections of customer receivables in certain large international markets were sluggish, and offset the lower capex. For the second quarter of 2024, we expect capital expenditures of approximately $190 million, including roughly $70 million for Sanad new builds. We had expected the first quarter to be the high water mark for capex for this year. However, some of the spend anticipated to occur in the first quarter for Latin America, Saudi Arabia, and the U.S. started lower than we had targeted. For 2024, we anticipate full-year capital spend to total approximately $590 million. The increase, as compared to 2023, reflects higher maintenance capex, an increased international recount, and preparation expenditures for a significant number of international awards from recent tenders and negotiations. Although capex from these recent awards should weigh on our free cash flow for 2024, we expect these long-term contracts to add over $50 million in EBITDA over a full year. In addition, Saudi Arabia EBITDA is expected to increase by another $50 to $60 million per year as the new build program proceeds. In concluding, I would like to point out that in addition to the international rigs we're planning to deploy in 2024 and 2025, 
We still have a number of open international tenders and active negotiations. It's increasingly evident that the remarkably robust international segment should continue to provide us with many more opportunities to redeploy existing rigs. These are coming with high returns and with very short payback periods. That being said, we intend to remain prudent. We will remain focused on generating free cash flow and reducing our net debt. With that, I will turn the call back to Tony for his concluding remarks. Thank you, William. I will now conclude my remarks this afternoon. As we look ahead, we see significant opportunities. From today, we have six rig startups over the remainder of 2024. More are on tap for 2025. This group should contribute significant incremental EBITDA over their multi-year contracts. To detail the remaining deployments, as of today, we have 10 in Saudi Arabia with three in 2024, followed by seven over 2025 and 2026, three rigs in Argentina with two in 2024 and one in 2025, and one more in Algeria in 2024. Altogether, these add up to 14 pending deployments. On top of these 14, we have the prospect for an additional three in 2025. This magnitude represents a rare opportunity, one that we are committed to capturing. Our investment in this environment now provides the foundation for increased free cash flow and greater financial returns in the future. Looking ahead, we are evaluating additional opportunities in Latin America, the Middle East, and elsewhere in the Eastern Hemisphere. Each of these opportunities would contribute significant free cash flow. As I have said before, we are able to use existing rates to capitalize on this environment. In tandem with these rigs, we see very attractive prospects to materially expand the NDS business with limited incremental investment. That concludes my remarks today. Thank you for your time and attention. With that, we will take your questions. We will now begin the question and answer session. To ask a question, you may press star then one on your touchtone phone. If you are using a speakerphone, please pick up your handset before pressing the keys. If at any time your question has been addressed and you would like to withdraw your question, please press star, then two. At this time, we will pause momentarily to assemble our roster. The first question today comes from Dan Coote with Morgan Stanley. Please go ahead. Hey, thanks a lot, and good afternoon. <clears throat> um, I just wanted to come back to the free cash flow comments, and I appreciate that, you know, th this year you're, you're kind of at the full run rate for the SNOD New Build program. Um, there's, you know, a lot, of, a lot of investment required for the wave of deployments that you have, of rig deployments that you have coming, and, you know, you also mentioned the higher maintenance capex. But I was just wondering if you can help us think through um, some of the other components that might impact free cash flow conversion um, um, this year outside of outside of the CapEx guidance that you gave us, whether it's, you know, working capital expectations, cash taxes, you know, even just if I look over the last five years, I think your average net pre cash flow conversion is in the kind of 30, 35 percent range. Should we be thinking about significantly below that this year, but is that a potentially achievable target in the coming years? Just anything you could you could share to help us think through um, the free cash line and, and free cash conversion. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Dan. That's a that's a good question. I think a lot of people are uh, are hoping for some answers on on the free cash flow for 2024. So as you know, we had to wait a little bit because we had a few or several. Uh, important tenders to be decided and uh, and certainly needle moving in both EBITDA and uh, and CAPEX. So we uh, we hesitated to give something until we, we had more visibility on those tenders. But you know what I can what I can do is tell you a little bit the main components of free cash flow for the full year. And uh, the most important is EBITDA. And uh, so we, we do think that the rigs in the U.S., lower 48, will fall some six rigs versus the prior year. Um, we were hopeful to retain uh, 
the same average rig count in 2024 as we had in 2023, but that just didn't happen. The market just moved down instead of going up as we thought. So that, that has some significant impact. And in addition, we do think that as contracts roll into the leading edge pricing, which has stabilized, unfortunately, but as they roll into those new leading edge prices, we're going to see a, maybe an erosion of $600 year and year. And if you look at that, that just, just math, that gives you somewhere in the range of $15 million reduction year and year in terms of the U.S. Uh, fortunately, in terms of the lower 48, I'm sorry, but in terms of Alaska and, and then offshore markets, we're going to see an increase of about $5 million so year and year. So that's a $45 million reduction for the U.S. Internationally, we hope to increase by roughly $50 million, uh, and that's uh, partially due to these uh, new awards, but also the Saudi Arabia increase in activity. Uh, so drilling overall on a global scale is going to be about $5 million higher than the prior year. And then we think NDS is probably going to be about 5% higher uh, versus the prior year, with the, internet, with the U.S. market uh, being a, a, a bit of a drag, but the international market performing very, very strongly. And finally, rig tech is going to be like a $10 million improvement year and year. Uh, and that is based on the fact that internationally, we are expanding quite a bit. Tony mentioned some of the awards we've seen recently. Uh, but also, energy transition is going to contribute to that, to that number. So all in all, uh, we think that we're going to beat last year's $915 million. And uh, the range that we can offer at this point, and again, take these numbers with a grain of salt. The uncertainty in the U.S. is still high, so you, we don't really have fantastic visibility given the, uh, the shortness of the contracts that we have today. And that's a, a trend for the whole market. <clears throat> but we think 900 to 920 to 930 million dollars is an EBITDA range that we'd be comfortable with. And if then if you look at the capex, interest expenses are going to be about 180 million dollars. Our cash tax about 50 million dollars. Uh, that takes you somewhere into a 100 million plus for the company as a whole. But in that number, we have a negative 60 for Sana, right? So we're looking to uh, about 160 plus. Uh, million dollars outside of SANAC for the company as a whole for those numbers alone. Then we, we expect working capital to provide tailwinds as, to our free cash flow this year. And of course, I haven't mentioned the pre-funding that we get on our capital as well that is paid in 2024. So if I were to put a number out there, I would say that our free cash flow for the company as a whole would be somewhere between 100 and $200 million in 2024. Uh, now, keep in mind that we do have some $60 million that are going to be bur consumed in Saudi Arabia, in Sanad. So outside of Sanad, that number would be somewhere between 160 and $260 million. So that's a range of free cash flow that we would have available to bring, on, bring down our debt in 2024. Does that answer your question? It, it does, and I think it, it probably answered a lot of uh, potential subsequent questions as well. So, so thanks for the you know super helpful color there. Um, may, maybe just a, a question on international contracts rolling, and and just I'm I'm trying to think through um, outside of Sanad and outside of the idle rigs that you're redeploying for the for the rest of the international that's working right now, I'm, I'm basically driving at is, is, you know, 2024 or some year in the future, a year where a big percentage of, of those rigs roll and, and would have the opportunity to kind of mark to leading edge in, in those international markets? Is, or, or are there years that you call out as being, I guess, significantly above or below um, what would be like a normal contract role if, you know, just for argument's sake, the average international contract is four years, then 25% of the rigs would roll a year. Um, it, you know, it, would you point to this year or any of the coming years as being above or below what, what the normal, um, you know, contract roll periods 
would be. Yeah. Looking forward for the next year, we're looking about 20% actually of the regs are rolling right now. And uh, I think the good news is with that number that given the market and given the amount of tenders out there, I think it, in terms of repricing, it does offer the prospect of maybe moving up to the edge pricing because all these contracts do require capital and all the capital is going to be at, at market prices and and some of these projects are significant amounts of capital. So I think the whole the whole sector is actually get, being pushed internationally up to up to market pricing and, and that's good for us. So that right now that would be a number I would I would refer to about the opportunity to reprice about twenty percent of the fleet. Yep. Awesome. Yep, that's exactly what I was I was driving at. Thank you very much. Um yep. I'll, I'll turn it back. The next question comes from Keith Mackey with RBC Capital Markets. Please go ahead. Hi, good uh, good afternoon, and thanks for the color on the, on the EBITDA and free cash flow. Uh, definitely super helpful. Uh, first question is just in Argentina. So you've got the three new rigs you're sending over there. Can you just just discuss what you're seeing in that market generally, where are rig counts trending and activity levels trending, and, and, and what is the spec of rig you're sending down to Argentina? Well, I think Argentina has been a, a great success for us because we've exported our technology in the U.S. today, and uh, right now the rigs that are going down are what we call the F rigs, which are uh, uh, 1,500 horsepower rigs with uh, a higher hook load than a normal 1,500 horsepower rig. And uh, the performance there has been outstanding. And so that, that has gained us a great credibility in the marketplace there. I think the good thing about the, the uh, Argentina awards is the fact that the next three are going to be redeployed out of the U.S., so that obviously shrinks the asset base here and shows that we have other advantages, other ways to, to redeploy that capital. And the second point is these contracts um, actually are going to have a significant component in U.S. dollars, which is also a big change in terms of where we are to make – makes us even more uh, optimistic about the, the market down there. So um, in terms of the uh, the Argentine, co Argentine contracts in general, I think uh, the, back the backlog for those just those three contracts would be about revenue back on about $200, $230 million, just to give you a frame of reference. And uh, as I said, I think the performance that we've, we've demonstrated down there, we, we've now um, – oriented the whole marketplace to NDS as well, which has really been a good driver for us. So it's not just uh, the rig, but also our software applications and magic presser drilling and, and casing running integrated into the rig are actually gaining a lot of traction there. And I think we have really good market positions on both of those in the country. And uh, that's a real success story. It's a re real conversion from the historical way that the market's looked at a drilling contractor. And, and that's what's driving some of the the uh, the move to sh shifting stuff to work to neighbors. Awesome, appreciate the uh, the comments there. Uh, just sticking with the international markets, uh, so the guidance for um, daily margin in Q2 is about 15.7 per day. Uh, I think you made a comment about getting that to 17,000 by end of the year. Can you just give us a bit of a bridge in terms of how you get there? So. So Keith, uh, as as I'm sure you've uh, you've you've learned by following a result, when you have a significant burst of deployments, you you have to automatically be a little bit cautious on what sort of, uh, gui of guidance you put out there for the margin, because there's always uh, shakedown periods and things like that that and that hurt the margins a little bit. So we are trying to be a little bit cautious. We do have some more deployments coming and and. Uh, and some recent deployments. A lot of rigs are being added to our fleet in, in the first and second quarter. So that's part of that. But uh, there is also uh, the fact that we renewed contracts in Saudi Arabia recently, and as part of that commitment, we have to do some recertifications of multiple components in the rig, and that takes uh, a couple of weeks uh, away from each of those rigs in terms of revenue generation. So so we are being, uh, in, this, in the first half of the year, uh, we do have some things that are going to disappear in the second half as all those deployments are completed in Saudi Arabia and Algeria. And uh, at the same time, the, the rigs in Saudi Arabia do have significantly higher uh, margin potential than our legacy rigs. They tend to be on the 
you know, near the top of, of margin generation, particularly the new rigs that we're deploying as part of our uh, agreement with Saudi Aramco. So, so those are the main drivers. So, so we do have a little bit of extra cost in the first half, and secondly, the rigs coming in in the second for the full year that are going to be fully impacting a result in the second part of the year do have higher profitability than than our legacy rigs. Okay. Thanks very much. That's it for me. The next question comes from Kurt Holland with Benchmark. Please go ahead. Hey, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I appreciate all that uh, all that color and, and detail um, on the EBITDA and the free cash flow. So, um, I guess, but the international markets, right, are, are, are clearly uh, strong. And, and you have a lot of opportunities uh, as you look out into 25 and 26. I'm just trying to reconcile something you guys said about um, you know, 50 to, to 50 plus million dollars of incremental EBITDA. Um, again, this is more like going out in the 2025 than, than what you just said for 2024. So, KK, just to kind of help out in that context, you've got five new Saudi rigs, and those five rigs could add 50 million in EBITDA, and then you got another handful of rigs outside of Saudi. I could add another X million of EBITDA. Can you just kind of yeah. help connect those dots? Let me, let me just do some gross some gross calcul calculus here. Let's put it this way: so the Argentine rigs plus the Algeria rigs represent about three hundred million dollars in backlog. And just by way of background, those the investments there and those rigs have around a, a payback of about a, a, a two year payback. Okay, on those rigs. Then when you layer on top of that the Saudi rigs, which have a a backlog of about 1.1 billion, and the short list, assuming we got the short list, that's 230 billion, uh, 230 million rather, that, that represents the backlog. The entire package of all those rigs combined when they're all on board would be an EBITDA run rate of at least $125 million at the end of 2025. That, that's why we're okay. so excited. That's great. So and that 125 million, obviously on top of your base, of whatever you're going to do in 2024. Okay. Correct. Yeah. All right. Correct. Yeah, that. Obviously, the obviously depends that the market stays stable and and all the stuff is it's fully incremental. But yes, that that that's all these things are incremental. So yes. Okay. Okay. Great. And then, um, so in the context of uh, the pro prospects of taking idle rigs and moving them inter internationally, how many just in aggregate, right? If if take beyond even what you already know you're potentially going to be moving, but how many idle U.S. rigs are feasible options to be upgraded and sent internationally? I think at, at the kind of numbers that we're talking about, I mean, I think if you li listen to what I just said, our, our payback on the, adapting these rigs is, you know, less than two and a half year pay, payback to, to move a rig into the international, these type of rigs, and I think we have another 10 of those available. So. Uh, depends, of course, on the market. Depends on every market's different. Every market has different VOP requirements, which, which drives those costs could drive those costs higher. But generally, we have about 10, 10 more rings that fit easily into the, into the international marketplace from from the U.S. Okay, that's great. And and it kind of gets to the crux of the, the question, Tony, which was then beyond those 10, it would then require, I would assume, it would require some some element of of new build, right? And Number one, no, true. No, 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 sir. Sir. no, no, no. I'm just giving you the numbers that are low-hanging fruit. I think we have a, okay. we have a bunch of we have a bunch of iron out there, and 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 the and the pending one that we've that we're in process, hopefully, of concluding right now. The three that I'm talking about, those rigs are actually in country, so it, it makes it even easier so for for those. So yes, we have we have additional assets internationally as well, not just in the U.S. But U.S. It depends on the opportunity. Some some if it's deep gas. With heavy BOP stuff, then you need an, internet, an existing international rig. If it's something more like uh, a, a version of the unconventionals, like in Argentina, then we could take one of our prime uh, U.S. rigs and, and move it down there without a lot of incremental expense. So it really different. You can't just have, it's not it's not a one size fits all kind of concept. It's more complicated than that. And by, by the way, it's not that the rest of the rigs could not be transferred. The, the reason we say ten is because the remainder of the fleet is more 
uh, is more adapted and has been adapted to U.S. drilling. So we, we wouldn't want to transfer those uh, at this point. But but the other ones can also perform very well in the U.S., but uh, have some, some characteristics that make it more adapted and easier to move to international markets. That's great. I appreciate all that. Now, one follow-up. Um, so there's been um, a lot of discussion about the prospect of incremental rigs needed in the U.S., you know, to satisfy the LNG export capacity coming on in 2025. And then there's been a lot of discussion here of late about incremental gas demand needed for the data center build-out. You guys got any rough numbers as to what the incremental rig demand could be from those two factors? It, it, I would say at this point it's pure speculation. I mean, I mean, we believe in the thesis that the export market is is real on LNG. You know, we believe in the macro the macro thesis about the drivers for gas globally, and in particular for uh, growth in non OEC non OECD countries, and particularly in terms of gas in particular for for AI. I mean, if you look at the electricity production in the U.S. for the past uh, roughly 15 years, I think it's been relatively flat. And that's because you've, we've been able to rely on efficiencies in uh, in use of electricity to offset the, the demand. But with this new AI stuff that's coming out, it's so intensive that I think the only clear answer is actually for baseload power is, is in fact, gas. You saw the announcement today about was, it was Amazon, I think, on the data centers that they're doing. And these data centers are going to be huge consumers. And therefore, you know, we think – we, we, as I said, these are all reasons why we really strongly believe in it, and we've been disappointed that it has happened earlier. But you know, we think as you go through this year, we think it should become more visible, and obviously, we're well positioned to handle that. Um, our, our our gas mix have obviously moved dramatically from where we were, you know, back in the beginning of last year to, to today, and uh, that market today is probably that. The Haynesville and the Northeast are the two most challenged markets in terms of lower 48 right now in terms of activity. And uh, But for the reasons you're identifying, I think, you know, the prospects are, are bright going forward. That's great. Well, we appreciate it. Well, even, even with all the transfers uh, that we have made and are making of rigs out of the U.S., we still have a significant number of rigs that we could ramp up in the U.S., with very limited costs and, and, and very short lead times. Appreciate that, guys. Thanks. The next question comes from Derek Podhazer with Barclays. Please go ahead. Hey, I just was hoping you guys could refresh us on your exposure in the, the Saudi Arabia market, specifically gas versus oil, and, and, and more specifically the unconventional gas, given this looks like an area of growth in the kingdom. So just maybe some more comments around your, your growth prospects and that unconventional gas play that's being built out there. Okay. Well, today we have uh, uh, roughly 80% of our rigs are in gas. And of that, eight, of that 80%, um, about uh, – just doing the count math in my head here uh, – about – 20% of the 80% is in the unconventionals today of what we have. And that the unconventionals, obviously, the, all the all the new bills that are being built are all can be yes directed it's up to a ramp go where they want to, where they want to put them. Oh, so far, they haven't moved many of them to the unconventional because they have so many other needs right now. But obviously, we can easily handle that. So of, of the footprint for us today, 80% is is in 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 gas and. Uh, the market as a whole, I think the numbers for onshore today, conventional is 84 gas, non-conventional is 22, and exploration is 37. Oil is 70. So it gives you an idea what how the market breaks down right now. Let me make a comment, though, on the 20%. Most of those could be redeployed to gas to gas activity. We're, we, we really do have the strongest fleet in terms of gas capabilities and deep, high-pressure wells in the kingdom. Uh, that makes sense. So, no issues as far as being able to move your existing equipment over there into unconventional fields. If that's where the demand pulls you, those rigs are ready to go and just then it could be slotted either conventional or unconventional. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Okay. That's helpful. Um, and then, uh, question for you, William, on the 
$590 million of CapEx. Any, could there be any upside surprise to that? Does that feel contained at this point, or how should we think about potential moving pieces that could push this higher outside of, you know, maintenance CapEx with activity, but anything on the horizon that's behind the scenes oh. that could surprise to the upside? Obviously, obviously, international basket, like I was referring to, is robust still. I think at the thir end of the third quarter, I told people there were about 55 opportunities in the marketplace that we were looking at, you know, sorting through. And at the end of the fourth quarter, that number was around 53, a little bit decline. Today, that number is 30. So there's thir still 30 out there. And obviously, you know, we'll, we, we sort, sort, sort through them and, and we'll see if anything really fits. And like the last person that asked the question, obviously we have some equipment that could be really deployed attractively, but right now, you know, we're, our hands are pretty full of what we got, but, you know, we'll still be evaluating that. But the good news is that that pipeline does show the robustness of the market, and that number outstanding is, you know, demonstrates the, how broad it is. And as I said in my remarks, I think the CanRig, the CanRig uh, award is another example of that, showing how, how, how deep this uh, recovery is in the international or upcycle is. And, and in terms of the pricing on the CapEx, uh, uh, I think uh, the fact that we manufacture a lot of those components, uh, those have relatively long lead times, uh, we're pretty much set for the pricing this year. I, we, we're not that concerned about pricing increases on, on CapEx components at this point. Got it. Appreciate the color, guys. I'll turn it back. Thanks. Thank you. This concludes our question and answer session. I would like to turn the conference back over to William Conroy for any closing remarks. Thank you everyone for joining us today. If you have any questions, please follow up with us. Betsy will wrap up the call there. Thank you. The conference is now concluded. Thank you for attending today's presentation. You may now disconnect.